Okay, so this is my investment journey so far, key being so far, because if it stopped now, it wouldn't be that good, all right? So, <laughs> uh, it's my path, what did I do along the way, and then some key aha moments that I've had, some wins, some losses, some learnings, and there's kind of a side goal for me of sort of just reframing and de-shaming some of the mistakes that I've done, and hopefully there's something in that for you as well that you can resonate with. So just opening caveat, this is super important. <laughs> This is not advice, yeah? If I'm seen to be giving advice, you guys can sue the hell out of me, all right? So there's no advice here, don't follow it, and it's not even given that I know what I'm doing, all right? So you know, take everything with a pinch of salt, and some things may apply, and some things may not, you know? So uh, anyway, so this is my journey. I've kind of passed it out in sort of three stages. It's my childhood, where I became a bit of a finance nerd, uh, way earlier than most people. Then I started off in finance, actually as young as 20. And then sort of around 27, 29, I pivoted into tech. And kind of now, I guess, sort of I've, I've developed a bit of a skill set at the intersection of the two. I'm just gonna take you through sort of my journey and then we'll have some learnings along the way. So 1986, I was born in the Norwegian winter, minus 30 degrees the day I was born. My dad at the time, he was working in oil. And in 1986, in January, when I was born, oil crisis plummeted, all right? So I've always kind of been born into this sort of backdrop of finance. My dad was very stressed, he just bought a cabin, just bought a car, and then I came home. So then 1992, we traveled to the US, and my family, we had like a party trick that um, they'd ask me what the US dollar Norwegian kroner FX rate was, and I would know it by heart. But I didn't understand that this moved over time, so I just thought it was the same all the time. But it was just, I guess the reason I'm telling it, I was a weird kid from an early age, you know? <laughs> I just cared about this stuff, I don't know why. <laughs> then 1996, my dad had worked in Egypt, and he did a really nice thing, and I guess I want to put this as a sort of um, caveat to everything. I've been born into privilege, so my parents and my grandparents have done a lot of decisions that led to compounding, and so that's partially also why I'm saying what I did doesn't necessarily apply to you. You know, we all come from a different background. And so what my dad said to me back then, which was really beautiful, he said, just after giving us the, the Christmas presents, he said, the biggest present I gave you guys is the Norwegian passport. It's actually true. It's the best thing you could ever have, honestly. And so I guess the point just being, we all have different privileges, so, you know, take everything with a pinch of salt. But yeah, 1998, 12 years old, we're at this beautiful cabin where we have our summer cabin, very modest, but very beautiful. Most kids would be doing like adventurous stuff. I was actually reading the back of the financial pages. <laughs> and I was just looking at these numbers. I, I loved maths as a kid. And so my mom, really beautiful of her, she told me, why don't you go and buy some investments? And so I ended up buying two shares, Patterson and Shipstead. One's an oil tanker and one's a, sh a newspaper slash online business. I didn't know what I was doing. To be honest, the main thing for me, I loved having the annual reports. So I would have them in my bookshelf. I just really loved that schedule. Really so yeah, just not a normal childhood. Right? The AGMs. Oh. And then a the third investment I had boss, my mom was working in hydrogen, so she thought that was a good idea. But I just researched it now, and I think they actually also produce weapons. So again, not a normal childhood, right? <laughs> and yeah, I guess just before this, I mean, I made a little bit of money on it, but not a lot. It wasn't that good. I just followed my mom's advice. Yeah, so. um, the one learning I had from all of this was this thing called price to earnings ratio. So I just want to kind of use this as a teachable moment. But this is basically the most basic sort of key concept in finance in terms of valuing shares and companies, okay? And actually, I'm, I'm, it's a, unbelievable to me now, but I actually intuited that from the back pages of the financial pages on my own, that that was actually the key ratio. And so it's basically you pay, let's say $100 for a share, and that share will, let's say, give you $5 of earnings every year, and that means it's a PE ratio, price to earnings ratio of 20x, okay? So just as a very basic idea, if you want to assess if a company is expensive or cheap, you'll look at this PE ratio. And the, the way you can think of that is 20x, okay, it takes you 20 years to get back your investment. Um, but the way to really think about it is that this earnings piece is gonna grow, let's say maybe 10% a year, and in that case, maybe you get it back over 10, 15 years. So the, we'll get to it later, but this, the growth of the earnings is really the key thing you're looking at when you're doing investment. Um, so just to give you some background, this is the PE ratio since 1910 to 
you can kind of see, okay, how extensive is the stock market over time? This is a sort of very basic way to look at the stock market. So 1929, 30X, COVID, 37X, stock car bubble, 44, and now we're at 30. We're kind of at some of the most extensive times throughout history, or you know, modern history. In 2008, during the financial crisis, we're down to 15. But the way you can also think about this is that maybe it's supposed to go up over time because we get richer and richer as a society. But this is kind of a basic way that you can just look at investments if you want to do. Cool. So stage two. Curious about finance. I went to Bath in the UK, studied business and finance. And I ended up living both there and there. Yeah. Beautiful city. So that's why I picked that photo. Uh, a year later, at 20 years old, I got an internship in Fidelity. So Fidelity is one of the biggest fund managers in the world. And my office was actually right next to the St. Paul's Cathedral. So I went, and this is the Waffling, which is the pub we went to four days a week. Uh, so yeah, one of the best commutes I've ever had in my life. And on the way there, this is what I would do. I'd read every finance book there was on my way to work every morning. I just loved it. Two years later, oh, it didn't work. <laughs> uh, Citigroup was the second biggest building in London, so it was this massive phallic symbol. Uh, I had an internship there in M&A, and at the same time, the world was collapsing. We had the GFC starting with Babcock and Brown here, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers. And then, a year later, I came back. So this is the building I worked in. And I, I actually have really good memories from this picture, because we had some of my best friends were in that building, and we just had a really good time. I think there's something about having a shared ordeal when we're all working our asses off in spreadsheets until 4 a.m. in the morning. But quite often, I wouldn't, I'd be like one of the last people to leave, leave this building every night. And quite often the lights would go out because I wasn't moving enough. <laughs> so I would just sit there and have to like move myself a bit to get the lights again. And everything was dark, you know. Two years later, I moved to a company called GIC, which is a Singaporean sovereign wealth fund. So basically, the Singaporean government uh, decides to save a lot of its money from all the little fees that they make from all the trade and the casinos and all the little things. And this fund is quite big now. It's $700 billion. And we were a group of 10 people in London who were charged with uh, doing a billion dollars of investments every year in various infrastructure assets, so like ports, airports, toll roads, uh, electricity, things like that. And so our offices were here. And at first I lived down here, so I would cycle across here. And then I lived here, so I would run to work here. It's a beautiful community. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, second and a half. And this is a bit, Georgia knows about this topic, <laughs> quantitative easing. This is one of the topics I care a lot about when it comes to finance, because it's quite important in my view. So just basically, how do you value money? That's something I learned during those sort of seven years, eight years. Um, the way it works is that you have three cash flows, let's say $10 in year one, $10 in year two, $10 in year three, and then you apply a discount rate, 10%, to those cash flows, because the, the basic idea is money today is better than money tomorrow, partially because I can put it in the bank, but also partially because of risk. I'd rather have it today than tomorrow. And so what happens is that you value these incrementally less and less dollars because of the risk associated with money coming in the future. So as you can see, just from having a bit of interest rates, you're losing some value in terms of valuations. And then if you do take the discount rate down to 5%, the value actually goes up by almost 10%. And if you were to extend this cash flow, the impact would actually be bigger, okay? The reason I'm telling you this, partially it's just, okay, this is kind of finance 101. This is how every company in the world is valued at a more sort of sophisticated level. But two is, during my time in, in finance, they did a really weird thing called quantitative easing, which very few people know about, but it's actually a really powerful force underlying finance these days. So quantitative easing is basically, this is the balance sheet of the US Federal Reserve. Uh, it used to be just $1 trillion. Then during the GFC, they weren't able to stimulate the economy the way they wanted to. So they put another trillion dollars into the markets just to kind of keep things going. Uh, then they did the second one, QE2, around 2010, 11. And the whole idea was that this was temporary and that 
you know, things would come back to normal. And then QE3 happened, which they called QE infinity. <laughs> and the, the amazing thing here was basically the markets and the Fed had sort of a bargaining fight about power. So what happened, they tried to stop doing QE and what's called the taper tantrum. So basically the financial markets threw a tantrum and let interest rates go up in the markets and the Federal Reserve basically got called on their bluff or their power move and stopped doing the, ta uh, the tapering. So, so that's 2013 and I was kind of in finance at the time. I'm like, this isn't real, you know, you're just making money here. This isn't, and this is, by the way, this is the beginning of Bitcoin. So this, this move here is what triggered Bitcoin to be developed. Spoiler alert, fast forward, 2019, this will happen in COVID, so they expanded it twofold. Uh, and again, this is supposed to be temporary, and they're just about to take it back now. But we're talking about sort of eight, seven, eight trillion dollars worth of money that needs to be pulled out of the financial market in theory. I'm not sure they'll actually do it. So why am I telling you this? Well, so what happened is the blue line, the blue bars in the background, that's the same chart as what you just saw. But the dark blue line, that's the cost of the US government borrowing money. And it's just getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as they keep putting more and more money into the market. Because all of that money is basically being borrowed to the US government from the US government, so to speak. Um, and so what happens is you have interest rates of around, or not interest rates, government cost of funding at sort of 0.5%. And so if you go back to the, the this equation here, sort of, what's happened is that all the valuations have gone up a lot, right? Because the, the, the discount rate that everyone's using in every model has gone down a lot. Uh, so I put in this picture here, I thought it was kind of cool. Because the story I have here is, what most people don't know is that we have a few sort of government funds, including the Singaporean, that have just absolutely minted. So the Singaporean government, $700 billion. The Norwegian government, $1.5 trillion. So these guys have become rich in a way that most people in the West don't realize. So we kind of still think of ourselves as the rich ones, but actually money has moved. So I, so I created this picture in mid-journey, and I thought it was really funny because I was trying to get the flags of the top 10 sovereign wealth funds in the world, and they kept putting the US in there. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you don't have the money you used to have. The money. <laughs> and I guess the story is we're not as rich as we used to think we are, but the one percenters and all the property owners are. Um, so yeah, I just made this one on mid-journey as well. So when you see sort of Saudi Arabia paying Ronaldo and Neymar a crazy amount of money to go play football there, that money isn't worth what we thought it was back in the day. So yeah, this is Howard Marks, one of my favorite sort of macro thinkers, and he just came out with a piece at the end of 2022 saying, we're in the biggest sea change that he's seen in 45 years. Where, so basically why I'm telling you this is, right now if you're investing, you're kind of going into really choppy waters. Uh, I'm not saying don't invest, but I'm just saying we're in a really complex time because all of these things are kind of coming at a, at a head. Cool, all right, part three. Time for a change of scenery, went to Stockholm, studied business at a master's there, and then kind of went a bit sideways. Everything went to the <laughs> There's a saying saying, if you're not a socialist in your 20s, you don't have a heart. If you're not a conservative in your 40s, you don't have a brain. <laughs> so I became a socialist at the age of 29. I hadn't been one yet, so you know, I had to make it happen. Started an app called Flight Mode. Uh, I mean, to be honest, it was a bit of a failure from the beginning. Um, but I really wanted to save the world with journalism and make them aware of all these things. And I was quite depressed, to be honest. I was just kind of really in a funk about the state of the universe. Then Trump got elected in 2016. And I kind of knew that before it happened. So just a week before he got elected, I was like really annoyed and really upset about the world and how dumb the media was and all this shit. So I sold all my investments, just sort of as a stroppy move. So I was right about the election, but I was wrong about the market reaction because they love tax cuts. That's all they care about at the end of the day, right? So the market popped, and then I was very wrong about compounding because, you know, the stock market just keeps coming up, growing up over the long term. So this, honestly, was my biggest mistake. The opportunity cost of that decision was way bigger than any other mistake. Um, but what I did instead was invest in life. I met Sim at Burning Man. Well, I met her before, but this is when we got together. Yeah. Yeah. Nikki Bronte, pursued love. 
and also pursued coding. So this is a cool picture. This is from someone's Tinder profile. I've cropped her out for her. <laughs> <laughs> but that's me in the background, in the back of Peach Pops, looking like a homeless person who's coding on my laptop. That's how, that's how much coding I was doing. I was just coding all the time, so I just thought I might as well learn it. So cool, so then two years later, my, my dad turned 70. And he's always cared a lot about money and, and finance and so forth. So what I did is I created a really cool birthday present to him where I got uh, financial data from sort of the day he was born, 1949 to 2019. And I mapped it off over five periods, depending on how gold performed in that period. So basically gold out underperformed after the war, when the economy was booming. Then we had the inflationary 70s, where gold was doing really well. And we had a booming unipolar world with the communism ending, where stock markets just went through the roof. Plus boom bust, stock on bubble and GFC. And then we've had this monetary expansion for the last 10 years, which is now about the end. So I guess now, I would say six reality bites or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I made for him. It's a really cool gift. And it's got like you know a chart for each of the five periods as well. Yeah. So this is how he, he, he saw his life, you know, this is, all the different indices. I've got, this is the stock market in green. But gold in, in, in orange there, you can see doing really well in the 70s when people were worried about inflation. Uh, I put sugar, because he loves to, buy, uh, to make beer. <laughs> oil, because he works in oil. And then the last three, which are quite interesting, this is what happens when you hold cash, okay? So that's just the, the effect of inflation over time. You're just losing money. Uh, three different currencies. So that's Germany, which had least inflation. US, which had sort of half inflation. And Norway, which had the highest inflation. What's the great S&P? S&P. So all of this is slight technicality. It's logarithmic, all right? Just so we can show compounding. So each centimeter, let's say, is a doubling, okay? So it's not, you know, it's not a linear graph, because otherwise it wouldn't look good. And you couldn't make sense of that. So okay, so two years later, 2021, 20, I'm kind of looking at finance again because I've been busy with tech, and I'm like, shit, what happened here, you know? The chart I showed you earlier, the Fed printing money. So I became scared. I had a bit of inheritance, and so I thought, okay, I need to do FOMO investing. I mean, I didn't call it that at the time, but that's what it was. So I bought Solana right at the peak. Not too much money, but you know, still painful. Then I bought Novavax, also at the peak, again. Most of these decisions were just done off of a whim, off of some someone's recommendation, and a lot of emotions and fear. Wow, okay, can't get the photo of shame. Anyway, so then 2021, supply chain issues. This is a picture of all the container ships queuing in, in Los Angeles, and I was kind of reading about this, and I, kind of, I was expecting inflation from all of this stuff that I've seen for 10 years anyway, but I didn't act on it. And Russia happens, all the oil and all the grain issues. I think grain and fertilizer is a big impact from the Ukraine war. Um, obviously, FTX collapsing and a bunch of other things. So, you know, reality is biting. So then I'd already bought some Snowflake shares. Snowflake's a company I really like. But what I did is, as things were plummeting, I kept investing. So I was like, oh, this is an opportunity, this is an opportunity, this is an opportunity. But what I realized is, you just need to know kind of roughly how far it's going to drop so that you have some sort of pool and I didn't have that. So and how do you know that? I don't think you fully can, but I'll get there a bit. But you can't, you can't fully. Um, then this is Microsoft, another company that I really like. And I actually invested a little bit earlier. And I was just staring at these charts and just being like, wow, this is a great company. But I just, by that time, I was too scared to invest, you know? And so I guess part of the story here is like, part of it is timing, but it's also just having enough conviction to actually go for it at, at various times. I'll, I'll get to that later, but this was another mistake. That's also part of the mistake, the story is, the mistake can also be the things that you don't do. I think that's how really good investors see it, the missed opportunities. Time for a breath. I was quite, you know, kind of hectic, sort of burning on. <laughs> waste some money. Uh, and then in 2023, I got made redundant, and I did a case study for SquarePeg, which is one of the big VC funds here, and I really love doing it. So I got a week, week and a half, to really look at 
one of the companies I've invested in and really makes sense of it. So I took their model, this is what they have on their website, where they basically look for theme, team, mode, and model. So the theme, is it, you know, is it a big trend that's gonna happen for a long time? Do they have good people? Mode, can the company sort of protect itself and, and stay profitable in the long run? And model, like how do they charge? How do they make revenue? So I did that on Snowflake, and the thing I thought was the coolest about Snowflake was this network here. So that's all the data marketplace that Snowflake has created where various companies can collaborate around data. So this whole period has led to sort of another aha moment. One is compounding. So Albert Einstein, he says compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He or she who understands it, earns it. He or she who doesn't, pays it. Warren Buffett, if you aren't willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. So he's, he's always talking about compounding as well. And then Charlie Munger, who's uh, Warren Buffett's partner, says, understanding both the power of compound interest and the difficulty of getting it is at the heart and soul of understanding a lot of things. So I kind of understood that. And one of the things I've worked on in tech, and tech business, is this idea of network effects. So network effects happened, they were first coined in 1908 by the CEO of AT&T, the phone company. So more than 100 years ago. Basically what he wrote was, a phone without a connection at the other end, without another phone to call, is totally worthless, which obviously makes sense. But in the last sort of 20 years, Silicon Valley and tech investors have really taken this concept to the nth degree, really understood the value of this. So network effects, at first they thought the networks were as valuable as the number of people in the network. But then 20 years later, this was sort of in the 60s, 20 years later, they realize actually it's exponential because it's actually the number of connections between these nodes that determines the value. But then after that, they realize actually it's even more exponential than that because within networks, you can have sort of sub-networks and groups and then this group can have a network with that group and so it's even more exponential. And so this is a, is a true force of compounding. And just to explain the term network effect, it's basically the idea that as a product has more and more nodes or, or users, it gets better and better and better. So think of Facebook as the obvious one. You know, it gets better and better until it doesn't. Because <laughs> uh, it can also have congestion, you know? A network can have too many nodes and then you need to sort of traffic them. So I read this book two years ago, Cold Start Problem, written by a guy who works in Uber. And he sort of des describes Tinder and Facebook and Airbnb and how these people created networks in very tangible ways highly recommend it. And then this year I took a course at NFX, which just, they're a VC fund in, in San Francisco who basically mapped out the 16 different types of network effects there are. And so it starts from the sort of super physical to the sort of marketplace ones, to the sort of super intangible ones like language, brand, beliefs, bandwagon, tribes, and so you can even think of uh, pit dogs as a network, right? Or, or Burning Man as a network. Most things actually are networks. So the more you think about this, the more you realize that the world, and especially the economic world, is made up of networks. So this is Facebook, for example. They've got a few different network effects. You know, the calendar is one network. Messaging is another one. The marketplace is a third. The ads is a fourth. The data that we feed Facebook is another one. And so all these compound in their own right, and then they interact with each other. There's a huge amount of value here. And then this is kind of how I've started thinking about it personally. And the one that I think they're missing is the talent network. That's what I've kind of realized big time now that I work in tech is just the value of working with lots of other smart people because it becomes more valuable to me. And I think basically CEO's company uh, job is to get all of these network effects to hum along at the same strategy. I think that's the essence of a company. The other thing I've realized is the power of scarcity. That's the other th sort of thing that leads to compounding. And so there's a picture of Bronte and all the lack of space there is. And, so, and then cities in particular are ultimate network effects times scarcity, right? So if you're buying a property in Sydney, you're actually benefiting from both of these compounding factors. Cool, all right, so that's the story in free learnings. How do I make sense of it all? Really quick. One is, so this is my philosophy now. I mean, my track record. As you know, it's not great, so don't, you know, don't take this to be the gospel, but this is how I see it now. Compounding is vital. The key factor to that, if you think back to price to earnings, earnings is way more important than price. If, so, if the earnings are actually compounding, price doesn't matter too much, because within a year or two, 
you will have gotten that price back. So earnings is really the key thing. And for me, that's kind of two things. One is, is there a structural tailwind? Am I riding the right market? And then two, does the company either have net network effects or inherent scarcity? So assets or patents or contracts or things like that. But buyer beware, you know? If you trust your instincts, to be honest, I've started trusting my instincts more and more because of a lot of these mistakes. Um, second question, do you want to spend time on these things? You know, it's not for everyone. Uh, do you have the willingness to do the money invest? And then maybe the most important, do you have some stable compounding at the core? I don't have that now. Well, I do actually in terms of career, but I don't in terms of property. And I would recommend everyone to get some sort of core compounding happening before you start picking stocks. So what are the prerequisites to get to compounding? I think one is to sort of save consistently, to invest consistently. I don't do it, so again, I'm not gonna preach, but actually the person who had made this slide template, she had this 50, 30, 20 rule. So I thought that was actually kind of cool. So she's saying 50% needs, 30% wants, and 20% of your salary should go into savings. Then the key thing I learned sort of from that snowflake and Microsoft share price thing is you need to have the confidence to invest regardless of where it's heading. You kind of need to be confident enough about what's going to happen seven years from now to be able to ignore some of those things. And then the third thing is you've got to be able to stay for the long term. So don't be a forced seller is something we always said in finance, but you don't want to sell when you have to, because then people can basically out bargain you. So things like, I, one thing I'm really happy about is that I actually waited a bit, because my life wasn't ready to invest lots of things. I, I had to move, you know. If you don't want to be a forced seller, you don't want to end up in a divorce, for example. That's also a forced seller case. You don't want to be an emotional seller like I was in 2016 either. But then I spent quite a bit of time on Saturday just rummaging on the why of all this. Like, why, why does it matter? I thought one thing is investing for your kids. It doesn't apply to me. I'm not going to have kids. I, I'm like, why do I still bother about this? Why do I care so much? Maybe it's investing for the next generation, like a bigger cause. I don't have that yet, but maybe that's a good reason. And then I thought, I think for me, it's actually to invest for my future inner child, and that's kind of been a nice realization from this whole presentation and preparing all of this, is I actually got a why for why I spend time on this. So that when I'm 50, I can kind of still have bliss and joy and creativity and all these nice things in my life. Okay, buyer beware, don't follow this, not advice, blah, 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 but very practically, <laughs> these are the things I'm kind of curious about slash investing in, so these are the things I've I'm happily putting money into. I mean, I still have money in things I'm not that proud of, but these ones I'm still proud of, even if they're down in the red. And I think that's the key thing. You gotta be willing to actually be proud of the ones that are losing money too. Property is something I love to get. Trusted, so I know someone who really believes in these companies. I haven't invested in them yet because I'm not ready for it yet. I wanna get in here first. And then I have a list of sort of companies that I'm intrigued about. All of these have network effects in various ways. And, and the way I want to approach it is kind of move companies to the left so that I'm more and more comfortable to invest in them in the long run, regardless of what happens. And then I've got some ETFs, sort of index funds and the things on the right, which is a lot more secure and a lot more stable. And uh, if you're getting started, I would definitely get started on the right-hand side because the left-hand side is the hard side. Last words, my brother always loved this in, in banking because we always had to put this on every slide we made. But investments and income from them may go down as well as up, and you may get back less than the amount you invested. Past performance is not a guide. Future performance, I certainly hope so. And that's it. Inflationary pressures, and so um, like 
I think some people would resonate with um, the idea of investing, but maybe very overwhelmed with this idea of having to try and pick stocks or make investment decisions. Um, and so um, just maybe a question around how to make investing more approachable or accessible and some general recommendations around either budgeting or passive investing as opposed to active investing. Um, but maybe you could get started on tomorrow. Yeah, so I think, I mean, budgeting, uh, if you can save, I, I, my dad had a really good saying on budgeting, which is nice. He says, budgeting or saving is the money that you, that you put away in the beginning of the month, not the end. I haven't lived according to it for one day, a whole time. <laughs> but I really think that actually hits the nail on the head. Um, and then in terms of what to actually do, so this list on the right, there's something called ETFs, uh, exchange traded funds, but they're basically very low fee investment vehicles. And they basically track an index. So a lot of them will have, let's say, 100 companies in them, the biggest 100 companies in the US, or 100 biggest mid-cap companies, 100 biggest Chinese companies. And so that's like, a, you don't need to think, you don't need to do much, low fees. That's where I would start. That's where I have started. That's where I put most of my money. Um, yeah, pensions, put some money in your pension. That's even, but then you're paying a bit of fees, but I mean, at least you're not making massive mistakes. <laughs> Yeah, what uh, do you see as the difference between doing everything, as you said the words you use, active versus passive, doing it your way versus um, super, and the way people super work? And, like, you, have you analyzed the difference between doing it personally versus doing super? Yes, the company I worked for, the first one, Fidelity, they do super. They're like the biggest super company in the US. And basically what they do, and I would like market for, I would write the document. They will take that index that I just mentioned, and the fund manager will say, oh, okay, a little bit more Exxon, a little bit less Shell, a little bit more Mercedes, a bit more, less BMW. So they make like marginal decisions around that index, and then they charge you 100% for that. Personally, I'm like, hmm. Is it effective compared to what they're doing? Uh, compared to me, yes. <laughs> Everything is not effective. Yes. Uh, a lot of these, people don't necessarily make a return, but the ones who do really do. It's like a re bit of a sort of, you know, the ones who are good are really good. But then again, the, there's a fund in, the, in Australia called Magellan, which was the biggest tech fund, and they've just gotten it massively wrong since COVID, and their share price is tight. So you never know, you know. Um, but you can also pick what uh, risk level you want. So, but, but ultimately, these ETFs are effectively the lowest risk because there's no decision being made. It's all algorithmic. So the more decisions, I mean, the more risk there is. Uh, and obviously, what I'm doing is high level of decision. So um, risk, yeah. yeah. I have a point about that, actually. So do you think about risk diversification and time, time frames as well? Like, does that come into your... For me, I think of it all as just, I should be able to leave it for 10 years, otherwise I shouldn't do it. So that's how I think about time. In terms of risk, yeah, I put it mostly here on the right, and that would be risking. But then I, I think risk has a lot to do with your age as well. Because if you're young, and I guess I'm still young, you know, ish, but if you're 30 years away from retirement, you can afford to hold it for 30 years. And so then you can really go up the risk level. But then as you get older, maybe if you're 60, you might want to put more of it. So there's basically like two broad categories. It's either you invest in bonds or equities. And bonds is basically you're, you're, you're getting like a fixed coupon, a fixed tip off of, an, off of a loan effectively. And that's way less risky uh, in many ways. And so as you get older, you might want to put more money into that because it's kind of easier to, to, to get your money out, especially if it's short-term bonds. So yeah, there's a, whole, there's a whole art to kind of, it's called asset allocation and it depends on your risk profile. But personally, I'm like, years from now, the world's gonna, you know, especially, and also that's a, the other way I think about it. If inflation's actually gonna kick off the way I think it is, the main thing is to invest in companies that have the ability to earn money 20 years from now, and then that's the name of the game in my mind. Um, I have one personal aha or learning, it was just by accident, and I just happened to
Yeah, I, I popped up my super in the middle of 2022. It was the only good decision that I made in the whole time. It's tax effective, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, super can be a super tax effective way of doing it. But I also know people who are putting all their super into Bitcoin, so you know. And, and, and when it comes to all this, I think one interesting thing that's about to happen in the next five years is that a lot of boomers are retiring. They're going to put a lot of, take a lot of money out of these uh, super systems. And these supers, this interest rate number, uh, all the way back to that one, all pension, pensions heading for a massive crisis, because this number is what they use to calculate the liabilities for what they need to pay to all the boomers. So they had massive deficits back here, and then they kind of managed to hide their deficits, <laughs> but they'll be back in deficits at some point. So, I don't know, I mean, I don't know. I would still put it super. I think it's still safer than a lot of things, but nothing's clear. All right, going once. Oh, oh. Do you like companies like Ray? Like What's that? I don't even know it. Uh, so you can like round up any of the FPOS transactions and it goes into the ETF. Ah, cool. Because you exposure to crypto as well. And so you're saving a little bit all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So paying a little bit more. Uh, I've never heard of that. Oh, really? yeah. I think it's all about saving a little bit all the time, right? Yes. Yeah, What's the corner? Yeah. Actually, similar to that, um, you know how property is a big information of what I'm doing here in Australia. Um, have you looked into any of the companies? I think one of them is called Bruce, and there are other ones that are circles, um, property circles, where they're syndicates, so they get together. sort of security. I, I can afford a deposit, but I just want security for living, like actually living. Yeah. That's how I think of it most. I think return-wise, some of these companies are probably going to do better than property in the long run, if you pick the right one. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's also something called REITs, which are like real estate investment trusts that are listed sort of, I think a lot of them are in commercial property. And the one thing you'll read these days is that commercial property is in for a massive hit. So. Sorry. Right. So Thank I'm you. Wrap it up with this. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So my takeaway is if you have FOMO, then it's probably not a good time to invest. And if you have fear, then it is a good time to invest.